Let's take a quick rundown on the analysis of acetic acid and vinegar experiments you'll be doing pretty quickly. Uh, this one just kind of runs over some of the experimental details, sort of a broad concept of what you're going to do. The calculations rely a lot on molarity, which you should be covering in class by now. In this particular uh, short video, we'll look at the, just the chemical background of this, some of the basics of titration, the idea of standardization, and a little bit of terminology you'll run across as we go through this process. The chemical background, vinegar by law is supposed to have somewhere around 4% or so grams of acetic acid per 100 milliliters. You may remember the acetate ion is C2H302 with a minus on it, O2 with a minus on it. This has a proton on it to make it an acid. What we want to do is we want to figure out in some acetic acid and some vinegar samples what the percent of acetic acid actually is. If you look at the chemical equation we've got down here, there's my acetic acid written out here on the left hand side. Here's where we're going to use sodium hydroxide for the analysis. So it's a typical acid base reaction producing water and the salt, sodium acetate. Notice that in this balanced reaction that the acetic acid and the sodium hydroxide react in a one to one ratio. So if I know how many moles of one of these things I have, then I also know how many moles of the other one there are as long as I can tell where it is that those moles are going to be equal to each other. steps in this process are really twofold. You'll be supplied with a sodium hydroxide solution to start with, and our goal for it first will be to find out what its actual concentration is, and to find it fairly accurately. We'd like to have it known to four decimal places uh, by the time we get done. And in that process, I and mean, the second part of it will be that standardization. The second part, we'll look at the analysis of it and say, okay, so we're going to use that sodium hydroxide whose concentration we now know to find out what the concentration of acetic acid is in vinegar. And so in standardization, what we'll do is find the accurate concentration of sodium hydroxide. The equation looks like this. This big ugly thing we'll talk about in just a minute over here, that's called, uh, that's actually the anion of KHP, potassium hydrogen phthalate. This is a hydrogen phthalate anion. You put a potassium with it, and you have potassium hydrogen phthalate. We can weigh that out. That's a solid, so we'll be able to get a mass of that fairly accurately. We'll react it with sodium hydroxide. They react in a one-to-one -one ratio. So once again, if I know something about my moles of KHP from its mass, then I'll be able to determine that that's actually the number of moles of sodium hydroxide as long as I find that point where those moles are equal to each other. And just divide it by the liters of sodium hydroxide, and I'm good. Analysis, all we'll do is turn it around and down in the analysis. We now know the concentra concentration of sodium hydroxide, so we can use that to find out something about our acetic acid that we have in our vinegar solution. So the scheme experimentally looks something like this. This guy up here is called a burette. We'll be working with that today, the stopcock here. In this position, horizontally, it's closed, so nothing's flowing through the tip. When you turn the stopcock vertically, you'll actually have liquid flowing through the tip. You can control it quite well by just moving it little bits at a time, so you can actually get to the point where you only have maybe a drop or half of a drop hanging on the tip of the burette and putting in a little bit at a time. The sodium hydroxide will spend its whole day up here in the burette. You're not going to switch that into anything else. It will always be the sodium hydroxide solution. And down here is going to be whatever we're analyzing. This might be the KHP. If we're looking at the standardization, this could be the vinegar. If we're looking at trying to determine the percent of acetic acid in vinegar. But the sodium hydroxide will always be up here and the analyte, the thing we're going to try to find the concentration of, is going to be down here in this particular flask. Now, what we have to do is, as you mix this colorless solution into these colorless solutions, you have this acid-base reaction go on, but you can't tell that because it doesn't do anything spectacular. You don't see things form, you don't see any changes. So inside of the flask here, every time you do one of these titrations, you'll want to put in a couple drops of what's called phenolphthalein. It's an indicator. It changes from colorless to pink, and what you want to do is get to turn a light pink, and you're going to do a little practicing. Uh, when you do the experiment. We're going to give you all the secrets about how to get a great endpoint, as we call it. What we want to do is give you some practice to go and figure out how you can best deliver and get the nice faint endpoint you want to get. When that phenolphthalein turns from being colorless into being slight pink, what that means is at that point you've matched the moles of hydroxide ion here with the moles of hydrogen ion you had in the solution to start with. That's called the end point of that titration. That's where we know that the moles of those two have equaled each other in that process. And so whatever you do as you go through this process, things where you can have mistakes, is if you're titrating, it's taking a whole bunch 
of sodium hydroxide to try to get the color to change. Step back and remember whether or not you put the phenolphthalein into this flask down here because it has to be in for every titration. Another thing to watch for is once you do one titration, you may use 20 or 25 milliliters out of a 50 milliliter burette. That means when you go to the second titration, you better refill that burette every time because you may run out. And you do not want to run out if your sodium hydroxide gets down below this level here in burette. That run is shot. If you can't use it, you have to do another one. So those are some experimental things to watch out for. We look at standardizing the sodium hydroxide. We're going to use this KHP. It's, this stands, by the way, for potassium hydrogen phthalate. It does not stand for potassium hydrogen phosphorus. And so when you go to add up the molar mass of this, it's actually given to you in a textbook, in the lab book. It's like 204.2 or something like that. This is a, this is a hydrogen phthalate anion right here. Right here, so potassium hydrogen phthalate is just all that ugliness with a potassium ion. If you want to know the molar mass, you just add all those guys up. They react with one hydroxide, one mole of hydrogen phthalate, reacts with one mole of hydroxide, produces this, and water down the side. What we can do with this, it's called a primary standard. Potassium hydrogen phthalate is very pure, very dry, very nice to work with. It's a solid. You'll go to the balance room, you'll get a mass of that. The recommended mass is in the lab book. When it says, maybe it says you know, 0 0.4 to 0.6 grams, what we really mean is go down there and whatever you see on that balance, you write down. You should have four decimal places on the mass of your potassium hydrogen phthalate. We paid a lot for those extra digits. Use them. Write them down. Then what we'll do is, once we know that, we actually then know how many moles of potassium hydrogen phthalate we've got because we know its molar mass. If I know the grams and the grams per mole, there's my molar mass. I can get it. We're going to put, put it in the, into the Erlenmeyer flask with some water doesn't really matter how many drops of water, a couple drops of phenolphthalein, and then what we'll do is titrate until the phenolphthalein turns just barely pink. Okay? The volume of sodium hydroxide we delivered out of the burette contains the same number of moles as the number of moles of KHP we had in the flask. So I could find the molarity of sodium hydroxide simply by taking the moles of sodium hydroxide I delivered to the endpoint, which is equal to the moles of KHP I measured out and then dividing it by the number of liters of solution that delivered to the end point of the sodium hydroxide. So it's not a very difficult process if you sit back and think about that for a minute. You're using the, the KHP to probe into how many moles of sodium hydroxide you had. Yes, we've got the acetic acid here. Now instead of the KHP, reacted with the hydroxide ion. But now what happens is we're going to put the an accurately measured volume of vinegar down in the Erlenmeyer flask. And now remember, we don't know his concentration of acetic acid. And then we're going to titrate that vinegar with our standardized sodium hydroxide solution. So it's still up in the burette, but now we know its concentration. Put a little phenolphthalein into the vinegar, do the titration. When we get that nice little faint pink endpoint, what we've got is that the moles of hydroxide have delivered. Sodium hydroxide delivered equals the moles of acetic acid. And so I can come in there right at that point, and because of your knowledge of molarity, realize the number of moles of sodium hydroxide I delivered is simply whatever its molarity is, which we got in the standardization, multiplied by the volume in liters that we've delivered in that process. And so it's a fairly straightforward process there, even when we can find the molarity in the vinegar. And that's a matter of thinking a little bit about how you're going to get to eventually grams per 100 milliliters. Keep in mind that if I know how many moles per liter, that means I can also figure how many grams per liter because I know the molar mass of acetic acid and then just convert to 100 milliliters. So let's take a little bit of a look at reading the, the burette. It's something you'll do time after time in your of course your chemistry time period. This is burette and we're looking at that here. Notice the burette is marked off at zero up here and it gets bigger as you go down. Okay? Don't pay attention to how long it is. We don't care if it's we're not gonna do anything with the 50 milliliter burette. We're gonna read numbers, read volumes off of this burette. And so up in here, what you'll see is a zero up here, and here's my one, and now this guy is marked off with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten divisions, which means if you read one of those divisions, this would be like 0.3 in here, 0 0.3. But on any kind of device like this, we call them an analog device where they aren't digital, they aren't throwing numbers in your face, we're always going to estimate at one digit. So if this is marked off in the tenths place, then every reading you take on here is going to be read to the hundredths place and recorded to the hundredths place. Make sure you do that. In this example in here, you notice that this volume is sitting right here, just about right on this line. If you look at where that line is, it's one, there's one, there's 
0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. He's right on 0.4. So when I wrote him down, I would write down 1.40. Now you may think that's silly, putting that zero on, because you don't need to put in your calculator. It doesn't seem like it's important. But he's a significant zero because he's telling somebody else that I read that to the hundreds place. It gives me a better level of precision on that particular reading. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of these, just get some practice at it, and then we'll wrap this particular video up. Over here, and these are, I apologize for the quality of these pictures, I just can't have a photographer type person and don't have a lot of patience for it. But if you look in here, this is a this is a reading inside of this burette. You know, the markings up here, 21, 22, 23, as they go down further and further. So what I want to do is get a reading on this burette. So you might look at that and say, well, with such a bad picture, it's hard to tell. But if I look in here, there's my 22 milliliter line. So you might go in and say something like, well, let's see, I read it right around there. It's pretty close to 22. So I'll just call it 22.0 milliliters. There's a couple things about that. One is you did not read it to the hundredths place. And the second thing is it's actually down below 22.0. And so that particular reading isn't any good. Then you might look at it again. Sometimes folks do this. They get a little upside down and backwards and say, well, it's going to be 23 point something. So they go in there and say, let's do this. If I start at 23 here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. He looks like he's like 28 point, 23.92 or something like that. So that looks like a good reading, except... Notice that volume is actually between 22 and 23. It's going to read 22 point something. And so 23.92 is not a good reading. And you might think of some other ways of reading it. So for example, um, I might go in and say, well, 22, is, maybe it's closer to the 1 here, so I'll call it 22.1. But again, I'm not reading into my hundreds place, which I have to have in every burette reading. So I'm going to go on and click there, and that's no good. And if I go through and start reading from the bottom, 23.95. Oh, well, it's right in the middle. So that's still not any good because I'm not supposed to read from the bottom. It's between 22 and 23. It's going to start with 22. So a reading for that particular burette right mark there might be something like here's 22. Here's 22.1. Okay. He's in between, isn't he? So you might say, oh, he's 22.05, something like that. And you do that, and that would be a good reading. 22.06 would also be a good reading, you're saying. So why do those why do those matter if it's not exact? You're estimating that last digit, and that's an example of how that works. Since that was so much fun, we'll try one more. If you're bored already, skip this because this is the last part of the whole video. So I come into here, and, and I'm going to point out on this one too. See the ring here? You need to get your eyes down so that this ring looks like one ring all the way around. It cuts down what we call parallax, so you're looking straight at the burette. It's kind of hard for me to do that with the camera and also with my eyes. So it's not quite perfect here. So I'm going to read this one. Think about what that might be. What do you think? Yeah, 4.6 might be okay. But again, we have to read the hundredths place. So I look at that where that water level is. I might call it 5.3 if I'm reading upside down, which I'm not supposed to do. It's, between, it's very obviously between 4 and 5. So that's no good. It's 4.6. Well, let's see. 4.6. One, two, three, four, five. There's six right there, see it? But he's hanging down below that, plus I don't have a hundredths place, so I can't use that reading either. 4.7, no hundredths place, can't use that. I need to have a hundredths place. 5.34, oops, I'm upside down again. There's 5.1, but no, these aren't five point. Those are four point somethings coming on down. And so I come into here, and a reading I might use that would look good is 4.66. If you notice, there's 0, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0 0.5. There's 0 0.6, and he's maybe a little bit further than halfway, so I might call him 4.66. And there's my reading for that burette. Read every one of the hundreds place. When you're using the burette, you'll read an initial volume. Then you'll read a final volume, and all you have to do is subtract your initial file volume from your final volume to figure out how much was actually delivered. Hope that helps. We'll see you next time.